Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Katherine Bryant. I'm the founder of the Speak Foundation. And today we have a special focus webinar, and I'm excited about this one. Um, it is on gene repair approaches with LGMD2I and LGMD2G, understanding CRISPR. Today we have with us Dr. Scott Wolf and Dr. Charles Emerson, and I will introduce them more formally in just a minute. And it's a very exciting event today. I want to thank Cure LGMD2I. They are the sponsor of today's webinar. So I want to kind of give you a rundown of what's going to happen today. We're going to first hear from Dr. Wolf and Dr. Emerson. They have a joint presentation, and we also will have a live Q&A with both of them. After the live Q&A, we will then have an interview with Kelly Brazo, who is the CEO of Cure LGMD2I. So just to give you a rundown on today's event. Also want to let you know, if you have LGMD2I, we have a webinar coming up on October 9th at 2 p.m. with ML Bio Solutions. This is a very important webinar. We will be talking about a promising new oral treatment for LGMD2I, an update on the development of BBP418. Dr. Sproul and Dr. Johnson will be with us during that webinar. If you have 2I, I highly encourage you to participate. There will be a live Q&A with ML Bio, and you'll be able to ask all those questions that you have about the Ribitol study. And this is a very exciting event that we will have on October 9th. You can sign up today for this webinar. You have to register at thespeakfoundation.com. If you'll go to our website on the very home page, you'll see this actual webinar and you can register for it today. And then I also wanna let you know about the National Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Conference. The dates are set. It's next year, September 17th, through the 20th, and this will be a virtual conference event internationally. So we're gonna bring everyone together. It's a free event for patients, and you're gonna hear cutting edge research, and it'll be an international virtual event. It'll be over 17 through the 20th. So you'll be um, available to register for that in early April of next year. So at this point, I'm going to introduce Dr. Emerson and Dr. Wolf. Dr. Emerson joined the faculty of UMass in 2013. He is the Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology and Neurology and is Director of the Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Program. Dr. Scott Wolf is a professor in the Department of Molecular Cell and Cancer Biology at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He studies genome editing systems and protein DNA interaction. So gentlemen, welcome to our webinar, and we're excited to hear from you. Well, thanks. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, talk to you about our work on gene repair approaches for limb girdle 2i and 2g. Uh, and Scott and I have been collaborating for a number of years now, uh, bringing together our expertise uh, to use this new technology to develop repair of genes that are mutated lead to muscular dystrophy. And uh, so it, this is a very promising technology, as you'll hear about. Uh, it's the beginning stages of application in the clinic, but it has the potential of really curing disease because it can correct mutations that, and make these mutations uh, resolve into uh, normal genes. So we're gonna talk again about 2G and 2I today. And there, as you know, diverse group of inherited muscular dystrophies. What we do as a collaborative team is we combine the power of induced pluripotent stem cells, iPS cells, with gene editing technologies, which really allow us to develop uh, novel therapeutics uh, and gene correction technologies for these muscular dystrophies. And I think you're gonna see that these muscular dystrophies have different mutations. And so one of the powers of gene editing uh, is that uh, you can, uh, there's a lot of in the toolbox for making uh, gene corrections. So 
you'll see that in the two examples we're showing you of the main work we're doing. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about induced pluripotent stem cells, which is a key tool for gene editing therapies. What this ther group of therapies, gene editing, starts with is patients. Not mice, not fruit flies, but patients, because we're trying to correct genes in the human genome. And so we need to have patients and patient genes to uh, work on correction therapies. So this is where the beauty and power of IPS technology is. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what IPS technology is and how it is, again, a new technology about 10 years old and, uh, and why it is so important for, as a basis for developing uh, gene editing technologies. So again, for both limb girdle 2i and 2g, we started with patients who had this disease and took biopsies of their skin and muscle and developed cells in culture, fibroblasts, which is skin cells and muscle cells. And we converted these cells to pluripotent cells. That's the induced pluripotent part of that, IPSC. And we do that remarkably by just adding four genes to, into these cells, introducing four genes, which then reinstructs these adult cells from patients and makes them into pluripotent cells, which are like very early embryonic cells. And it's called IPS reprogramming. So remarkably, four genes can take your genome for any cell in your body and make it into a pluripotent cell. Then these pluripotent cells, what is the characteristic of them that's so important is that they can become any of the cell types of the body including skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, which are often affected in muscular dystrophies. And you can do that in a variety of strategies which are very actively being worked on. So from a patient with muscular dystrophy, you can make a pluripotent cell, an IPS cell, rather, rather uh, quickly in the laboratory, a month or so. And then with technologies for making different cell types, you can study how these patient cells uh, might show a disease phenotype. So on the next slide, yes. Uh, so what we've done with iPS cells from the 2i and 2g patients is develop a technology to make muscle cells from these iPS cells. So iPS cells are pluripotent. They can form any cell in the body. So we want them to make muscle cells, uh, particularly muscle stem cells, so that we can work on correction strategies that would correct a muscle cell for a muscle disease. And as you'll see, the mutations that we're trying to correct for 2i and 2g affect muscle, as well as some other tissues, but primarily muscle and muscle function. So being able to make muscle cells from iPS cells is a, tech, a very important technology. So with the help of the 2i Foundation, we developed a technology to very efficiently make muscle stem cells from iPS cells from patients with muscular dystrophies, limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And this is all a, a, a very um, amazing process because it can happen by just adding growth factors, that is small molecules, uh, not adding new genes or anything, just adding molecules that normally signal uh, cells to become this and that in the embryo in the right sequence in the right time. And so with that, we can make these induced secondary myoblasts, which uh, are muscle stem cells from iPS cells. And we can do this in a matter of, in very high efficiency in a matter of weeks. And these muscle stem cells can give rise to muscle, as I'll show you in a second. I, uh, shows a picture of the stem cells there. As, and um, so they can give rise to muscle uh, and so you can study actually not just the stem cell, but the muscle that's differentiated from muscle, from uh, the stem cell and the disease pathology that results from uh, the mutations that occur in the iPS cell and in the patients from which the IPS, IPS cells were derived. So again, this work was front funded by the 2i Foundation and the Muscular Dystrophy Association as very early stage work, uh, high risk work that foundations often support to get new projects going. So very important funding from uh, these foundations. So we compared, did a lot of work uh, on these IPS-induced muscle cells, compared them to 
adult muscle stem cells you can get from muscle biopsies. And they have very similar properties to uh, adult muscle. And that's very important. And particularly, they will differentiate into muscle in culture uh, to form muscle fibers. And you can see the fibers here from adult biopsy cells and form from uh, iPS cells. So they'll differentiate. And when cells differentiate, they form muscle. And many of the diseases we're studying, including 2I and 2G, the problem with the disease is in muscle fibers. And so here, having this model, the cell-based model of iPS-induced myoblasts allows you to study from a disease patient the, uh, their muscle differentiation and what happens to the pathology of muscle fibers in a very controlled environment, that is tissue culture. Another thing we've discovered with iPS cells is that you can make these stem cells, the myoblasts, differentiate in vivo by engrafting them, stem cell engrafting them into mice. So you can take immune deficient, my, deficient mice and inject these stem cells you make from iPS cells into the muscles of, of, of mice and you can get them to form human muscle, human diseased muscle in mice. And the next slide will show the next part. You can see that by doing a histology of these muscles and all this red is, uh, and green, uh, all this red uh, is got to do with human muscle. You can take a muscle in a mouse and make it almost entirely human. And if it's a diseased human muscle, you can see that human muscle properties in an actual um, living organism. And this is very important because when we develop these iPS-based technologies for gene correction, we'd like to be able to not only study how to correct the gene and tissue culture, but be able to develop the technology to deliver the correction to animals and to an animal model that could then be applied to a human. So iPS technology, they be able to make stem cells from iPS cells from patients and be able to make muscle and make muscle both in tissue culture and in mice is extremely uh, powerful technology for uh, proceeding with now uh, developing uh, gene correction technology. So on the next slide. So why are iPS cells and iPS induced myoblasts so important for uh, gene editing and, and using this technology to move forward to do gene correction? So one I've already mentioned is that these cells come from patients. If you want to correct a, a disease, you want to have to correct it in a patient and a patient cell with the genome of the patient. So iPS gives you an advantage to be able to look at patient cells and do research. But these cells are unique in their ability to develop gene editing and gene correction technology because they're very efficiently able to accept the gene editing machinery that's required to edit genes. And we'll talk about that in a second. This Cas9 and guide RNAs, very efficient. They can be maintained a long time in culture, uh, passage many times and grow uh, to very large numbers. So you can study the effects of gene editing uh, with cell and molecular assays very readily in iPS cells. And then third, you can engraft them, as I just said, into mice and studying how this how to introduce editing into real muscle in a, in a living organism in vivo. So the iPS technology really laid the groundwork for Scott and my gene editing projects uh, on 2i and 2g. So I'm going to now talk about 2i and the, the editing strategy we have developed for the 2i. And Scott's going to then talk about the editing strategy for 2g. And again, the core work we did to get these strategies and test them was in iPS cells and an iPS myoblast. So limb girdle you're very familiar with. Uh, and the main feature of the limb girdle is that it's an autosomal recessive uh, that's caused by mutations in a gene that encodes a protein called FKRP. And there are many, many mutations in this protein called FKRP. It's an enzyme, a protein that does work. And it, what the work it does is to put sugars onto a protein called alpha dystroglycan, ADG, right there, which is outside the cell, made by muscle, outside the cell, and it's covalently linked, that is chemically attached to glycans. 
And FKRP plays a key role in putting these glycans onto alpha dystroglycan. And mutations in, and so what, uh, what these glycans do is hold the muscle cell in tight position to the extracellular matrix that muscle fibers are surrounded by. So that the muscle doesn't tear apart when it contracts. It's a heavy duty machine muscle is. And so when it contracts, it puts a lot of tension on the muscle tissue and uh, to keep it from breaking apart, it's held by these uh, glycans, these sugars put on by FKRP uh, to the matrix. So what happens when you have mutations in the FKRP? Well, then you don't get glycans put on very, effic very efficiently onto the alpha dystroglycan. And so the muscle then when it contracts, pulls away from the extracellular matrix and starts to degenerate because it can't help be held in place by the sugars that FKRP puts on. So it's a very important enzyme in being able to uh, hold muscle cells in place and keep them from degenerating. And so limgirl 2 i among other FKRP mutations, uh, is affected by not having enough FKRP function to produce these sugars. So now to start with a gene editing therapy, you need to know something about the gene and the Human Genome Project was a, just an amazing accomplishment by scientists where they were able to do and sequence the entire human genome and create a library of sequences all on computers of genes. And so once that was accomplished, it was possible to look at uh, diseases and figure out, well, what's wrong with the genetics of the disease like 2i or 2i related FKRP mutations. And what they discovered by doing sequencing of 2i patients and FKRP mutant patients is that there are mutations scattered throughout the protein coding region of FKRP. And that's all in one piece of DNA, one block, it's called an exon. All those mutations, in 2i there are very specific mutations but there are mutations that, uh, that, and those mutations cause somewhat loss of function of limb girdle, of uh, FKRP. Other mutations call, com, cause complete loss of FKRP, like uh, Walker Warburg. And depending upon the loss of FKRP function, where the mutation is in this block exon 4, that's the disease severity that one gets. So there's lots of mutations in exon 4 that lead to muscular dystrophies and clinical severities related to where the mutation is. So what we, what we thought when we looked at the genome and, and saw that um, all the mutations were clustered in one block of DNA in so-called exon, we came up with an idea about how we wanted uh, to develop a, ther a, gene, ther a gene correction therapy. Uh, so again, the FKRP is important uh, for the stability of muscle fibers, and next, uh, Scott. And so the protein maintains the structural integrity. So one of the things with the technology we're gonna be using is that we can perfectly correct the FKRP protein uh, and that would correct the muscle stability and function using this kind of gene, CRISPR gene therapy. So let's go and look at what we, what, how we did this. So first, a little bit about CRISPR technology, that is the gene correction technology. It's very simple. This is a technology, this is a system of uh, DNA modification developed by bacteria to protect them from viral infections. And scientists realized that they could be used as gene editing tools. So there are basically two components, an enzyme called Cas9, uh, that's, that's shown in gray here, that plops on DNA and what its job is to do is to cut DNA, that is to break the chemical bonds between the two strands of DNA uh, to create a double strand break. Then the second component to the, um, to the, to the system, the CRISPR technology is guide RNAs. And so these are se sequences that are related to uh, genes. Uh, so there are nucleotide sequences that will pair up with genes in a specific, highly sequenced specific way. So, Cas9 doesn't know what, where to go in the genome to put double strand breaks, but if you have a guide RNA that can associate with it and bind to the specific gene and specific sequence of interest, then the enzyme will do its job, that is Cas9, and cut DNA very precisely 
at the spots you want. And then what happens is the cell machinery can take over and then do gene correction with some components, additional components. So you can rewrite the sequence. You can introduce a, a break in the DNA exactly where you want it, where the mutation might be. Well, I'll show you where we're gonna do this with FKRP. Uh, it's a little different, but the mutation itself. So, so this, this technology we used in a couple different ways to correct FKRP mutations and 2I uh, mutations. So one way is to, ins it, and the basic concept here is we're not going to correct the individual mutations because there are too many of them. That was our idea. There's lots of FKRP mutations, some which cause 2I, but there's multiple ones there. So we decided we would insert an, a, a normal wild type that is unaffected good exon 4 into the FKRP gene using CRISPR technology. And so here we see a cart target site between just upstream of this exon, which has all the mutations in it, exon 4. So we were able to cut that with the enzyme, and then we were able to insert in a synthetic a piece of DNA, which is completely normal, exon 4, and, and makes a normal uh, uh, FKRP protein. So it... it um, completely replaces the bad exon four. So that's one approach. And then a sort of related approach is we, instead of sticking the, the cassette of exon four, the wild type cassette into the intron that is between the gene, in, in the middle of the gene, we put it right next to the bad exon and cut it there and inserted it right there. And so, and you'll see that the exon insertion that goes right next to exon, the diseased mutation exon is more efficient. But in any case, we had a couple strategies, but the basic concept here is we can replace exon four, that is we can treat every, we in principle treat every muscular dystrophy caused by F, uh, FKRP mutations by putting in a cassette like this. It'll then be used instead of the mutant exon. So now the question is, does this work? And so first thing we showed was that yes, we at both those sites, the middle of the gene site and the that's there and then over by the exon four very efficiently we can direct cas9 with a guide rna very specifically to cut those sites at, at almost 90 to 195 percent efficiency extremely easy to direct and this is in ips cells and in ips myoblasts so Again, we're starting with the iPS cells. So all this work is done with iPS cells so, um, from a patient. Um, so then we, uh, let's see the next slide. But, but I think one of the problems is the, the efficiency, well, then what we showed next was we could ver show that when you did this correction very, and, and introduced these, this exon, this wild type exon, making good FKRP protein, we could actually correct iPS cells totally for the ability of FKRP to make these sugar chains that are on alpha dystroglycan, these glycan chains that are deficient in, in uh, FSH, in, in uh, FKRP mutant uh, people in, uh, two, in two eyes. So here you can see no glycan chains uh, in this patient who has, is deficient in FKRP, but when we do the gene engineering, you get with this green color, it shows you the glycan chains are there. It's an antibody staining. So it's very efficiently corrected these cells for the ability to make um, functional, not only make FKRP, but make functional FKRP that corrects the glycan mutation. And on the next slide, uh, you can see that also if you look at the repair uh, and look at the expression of the FKRP wild type gene, that exon that we introduced, uh, uh, and you can see that it's expressed in that uh, the UTR donor, that's the, the, the most effective one, uh, is very effectively expressed. So it's not only expressed, but it makes the glycans recover and be um, uh, and, and be normal again. So in principle, it should be correcting the disease. So right now what we're doing is trying to develop a more, to make this correction, particularly with the three prime uh, insertion, much more efficient than it's been in, in, the, 
in our original experiments. But so we have very good proof of principle now that we can correct the FKRP mutations, all of them with one cassette. And uh, so now we're gonna try to increase the efficiency and develop some ways to introduce this system into mice, into the xenograft mice. So it's, it's, so it's a sort of a unified strategy for FKRP mutations that definitely can be applied to limb girdle uh, to eye. So that's the story we've, we, where we are with the, uh, using this technology for gene correction in combination with iPS cells uh, to, from patients uh, to uh, correct this mutation, the mutations in FKRP. And so Scott's now going to talk about 2G. And what I think one thing to keep in mind about that is that, again, it's all about what the mutation is. The gene correction technology in combination with iPS cells, the gene correction technology, the toolbox is enormously growing and powerful for different kinds of mutations leading to different strategies. With the 2i, we use this exon cassette approach to correct mutations throughout the coding region in one fell swoop. The 2G, when Scott looked at the mutation that was there, it was, he came up with a really good idea about to test about how to uh, correct this mutation. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to him now. Cool, thanks, Charlie. So uh, limb girdle uh, muscular dystrophy 2G is an autosomal recessive disorder. Um, and so in this case, the gene that's associated with it is TCAP, which encodes a protein called telethonin. So telethonin is a, a component of uh, uh, the muscle cell that uh, caps tighten and uh, plays an important uh, role both in, in integrity of the muscle and maybe also in signaling. And as, as Charlie mentioned, um, this was really a spontaneous uh, project that spun out of Charlie and I discussing um, uh, an allele that's common, uh, mutation allele that's common in East Asians, uh, which turns out to be an eight base pair duplication. And this eight base pair duplication, what it does, it's an exon one and it throws this gene out of frame so that you, when you um, translate uh, this gene into protein, you don't get a full length protein. And this duplication is uh, a really interesting phenomenon in the sense that as Charlie was mentioning, um, Cas9, when it makes a double strand break, it, it drives certain types of DNA repair. And one of the types of repair that it can drive is actually collapse between two different um, sequences that are identical on both sides of the double strand break. And so Charlie and I wanted to see whether we could revert this back to the wild type sequence directly by using Cas9. And so this is a collaboration that's uh, also in conjunction with Greg Cox at uh, Jackson Labs and, and Miguel Santa Estevez, who's also at UMass Medical School. And so uh, Charlie and I, I our, our idea was to um, target Cas9 using guide RNA, as he mentioned, program it with a guide that would recognize this eight base pair duplication and make the break near the center of this sequence. And we hope that an endogenous DNA repair pathway called microhomology mediated injoining, which is the acronym for that is MMEJ, would cause this sequence to collapse back to the wild type sequence. And so this again is where um, the power of IPS cells comes in because Charlie um, um, generated iPSCs, um, iPS cells from a patient that was homozygous for this eight base pair of microduplication. And then we could electroporate in a protein DNA, a protein RNA complex of the SPCAS9 with a guide targeting that sequence, um, get edited iPSCs out the other end, and then do deep sequencing. Deep sequencing is a method for generating millions of sequences um, from genomic DNA using an uh, Illumina sequencing instrument and determine the outcome of the editing experiment. And excitingly, what we found was the rate of gene modification targeting this site was very high and that about 50% of the alleles in these cells had reverted back to the wild type sequence. They had deleted eight base pairs and just regenerated the wild type sequence. Now, importantly, when we treat wild type IPSCs with this exact same complex, 
they don't cleave at all. And that's how specific this system is because the uh, complementarity of the guide is not perfect to the wild type sequence that won't cut it. And so it's stable in the context of casting. So with um, this exciting data, we were curious, you know, what fraction of the IPSTs have uh, a corrected allele? And so um, Charlie's lab made clones. So it um, took and plated individual cells and grew them up from this edited population. And then we genotyped them. We determined how, what fraction of the alleles had reverted back to the wild type sequence. And we found that over three quarters of the cells in this population had reverted back for one allele to have the wild type sequence. So this is really exciting. It looks like a very efficient restoration of the wild type gene. And so now we were curious, um, would this uh, allow telethonin expression in the context of myotubes derived from these cells? So telethonin is the protein that is encoded by TCAP. And so again, Charlie's lab um, took iPSCs that either had been um, the original mutant ones or those that had been edited, differentiated those into myoblasts, which are sort of like muscle stem cells, and then differentiated those into mature myotubes where he could probe with antibodies for telethonin whether or not there was a signal indicating that the protein had been expressed. And what he found um, from these cells is that patient cells as expected didn't express telethonin, but those where we had corrected one or two alleles showed expression of telethonin that was similar to control cells. So it looks like this is repairing the, uh, not only repairing the gene, but restoring protein function. So we wanted to also see whether we could do this not only for um, iPSCs, but whether you could do this for myoblasts. And as Charlie mentioned, you can actually harvest myoblasts from a patient. And so we were curious whether we derive, Charlie derived these from um, iPSCs, but in principle, one could um, derive these from a patient as well. So uh, we treated the myoblasts again with our um, Cas9 complex um, test, uh, looked at the editing in the genome by Illumina sequencing. And excitingly, again, we found that about 50% of the alleles in this population have been corrected back to the wild type sequence, which is very encouraging. So it's not just in iPSCs, but it's in myoblasts. We can do this direct. We can do this editing. So what about um, a, a cell type that's relevant to the patient population? And those would be cardiomyocytes. And so for cardi one or one uh, muscle group would be cardiomyocytes. So uh, muscle cells of the heart. And so Charlie's lab can differentiate iPSCs from patients through a different protocol into cardiomyocytes. And then we could edit these cardiomyocytes again by introducing our Cas9 RNA complex into these cells uh, through a process called electroporation. And then we can sequence the genomes at the other end. Now, um, cardiomyocytes, just to sort of demonstrate that that's what we had um, with regards to the edited cells, um, they have a marker on their cell surface, CD172. Uh, and so we could um, uh, sort these cells out and then stain for a, a protein that's common in these cells, cardiac troponin T, and see that the majority of cells in the plate um, stain positive. Uh, this is showing the same picture where we're staining with DAPI so we can also see the nuclei. And what we found with regards to that cardiomyocyte population was again, about 50% of the cells had restored the wild type, um, had restored wild type alleles um, within, or 50% of the alleles within the population restored the wild type sequence. So again, this is very encouraging with regards to um, a method that we could use for gene correction. But this is all in um, cell culture that we've been doing this. And so now working with Greg Cox at the Jackson Laboratory, we've generated uh, a mouse that actually contains the human eight base pair of microduplication in the TCAP gene. And so we've just got these mice now. And so now what we can do is introduce our editing reagents um, in different forms, whether it's a viral delivery or we're delivering uh, protein RNA complexes directly. And we can look to see whether we can um, correct that eight base pair of microduplication in vivo in skeletal muscle in the heart and start to look at actually outcomes in vivo in this particular model. 
So um, we're moving forward on this and we're very hopeful that we can translate this efficient uh, gene correction for this particular allele um, into uh, reagents that could be used in, in patients. So that's uh, a quick overview of the two different projects that we've been working on. So the first one for uh, LGMD2I, we've uh, done our proof of principle experiments showing that we can um, correct or repair, I should say, the FKRP locus and restore glycosylation of alpha, alpha dysglycan. And so now what we're doing is working to translate this um, more efficiently to disease relevant cell types. And uh, as Charlie mentioned, working with the xenograft system so that we can implant um, essentially um, make muscle of LGMD2I patients in mouse xenografts and look for gene correction in an in vivo setting. And similarly with 2G, um, we mentioned how we can um, correct a particular type of mutation um, using a microomology mediated endpointing based correction repair strat strategy in the TCAP gene. And the next thing is to really translate this in vivo in this mouse model. And also, again, we'll be very interested in using Charlie's Xenograph system to do this as well, because we'd like to actually demonstrate that we can do this in human muscle that's been engrafted uh, into, into mice. And so then finally, what we want to do is really thank those who uh, did the work. Uh, Charlie and I had the privilege of presenting this to you. Uh, but we really didn't do the experiments ourselves. Um, so this is really a team effort. That's a, it's a exciting collaborative science. Um, uh, in my lab, uh, Sukanya, uh, Asneya, and Pangpang were critical with regards to doing the core experiments as well as member, many other members of the lab. Uh, Charlie's lab, uh, Dong Sheng and Caitlin uh, played really critical roles in both the, uh, the 2i and the 2g, along with Jennifer, Shaoling, and Jing. Uh, Oliver King has been a very important supporter with regards to bioinformatics. Greg Cox, as I mentioned, uh, has generated the 2G mouse that we're going to be doing in vivo work on. And Miguel is going to help us with regards to AAV delivery of our various um, uh, editing technologies into cells. Uh, we want to thank the Transgenic Core for generating our iPS cells, uh, the Deep Sequencing Core for um, helping us to do the sequencing. And then finally, we really uh, couldn't do this work without the support of uh, many foundations and the NIH. Um, without the funds to do this work, uh, honestly, it wouldn't have progressed at all. And so we're really indebted to um, uh, uh, these foundations, inc including Cure LGMIG2I, um, to having the confidence and faith in us to uh, allow us to uh, try these experiments out. Uh, and so uh, Charlie and I would be happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Um, and we, we thank you for the opportunity to present our, our uh, joint work. Thank you so much. You guys did a wonderful job. Um, we have, have a lot of questions, so I'm excited to share those. Um, let's start with our first question from the audience. Would this work on adults? And if so, when do you think it would be ready? Scott? Uh, so I, honestly, we still have a ways to go. I, I mean, I think that things are looking very promising, uh, but the, the first thing we have to do with either of these therapies is look at the efficiency in vivo in the mouse models that we're, we're putting together or in the xenografts so that we can uh, look at both efficacy and safety. So those are gonna be key metrics that the FDA is gonna look at with regards to the ability to translate um, these technologies into patients. But we really are at the stage now where we're just beginning these in vivo experiments and things could move quite rapidly. Um, delivery is certainly an important issue with regards to these systems and something that we're trying to work out as well. But in principle, the approaches that we're uh, working on uh, should be uh, amenable to adults. Uh, our anticipation is that the, the DNA repair pathways that we're harnessing uh, will be active in uh, adults, uh, adult cells. Okay, wonderful. Um, we had a comment and a question. This is really exciting research. What is the timeline? Um, I know that that's kind of pushing you a little bit. I'm almost going back to the other question, but in terms of years or what do you think in terms of years or 
months before this technology could maybe reach human clinical trials? Um, I would, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, it's not months. It's, we're talking years, but not the different for 2G. One of the important things with 2G is if you look at the strategy, it's extremely efficient. Uh, and it only takes, and that's because it's very simple to deliver just the enzyme and guide RNAs. And the cell just, you're just asking the cell to do its job, which is repair these duplications. And, and uh, so we, in terms of timelines, that's the, and we now have a mouse to be able to, to develop the delivery to muscle. So, that's, so we know it works. And we know it works efficiently with 2G. Now it's how are you going to deliver this to muscle? And this is not, there's, there are ways that are known, AAV, for instance, to deliver these kinds of mach this machinery. And there's new technologies coming up. So I, I think this is, we, we think this is very promising for, you know, within several years to be, and that's our goal. With the 2I project, it's more, we, we need to improve the efficiency because it requires not only the enzyme and guide RNA, that is Cas9 and guide RNA, but it requires some more tricks that you have to do to get the efficiency up. But, you know, we've already been making progress towards that. And we have the mouse models and the xenograph models, which really give the xenographs, I should say a little bit more about that, that give you an opportunity to really go to clinical trials because you can take a patient's human stem cells and make their diseased muscle in an animal and you can try to cure that diseased muscle in an animal it's not like curing a mouse you're curing the human disease in vivo so again it's it's going to take working on the efficiency but the train runs very fast in this field you know this every in Scott's particularly developing a lot of technologies to improve efficiency, but there are others. And so, yes, it's, we're, you're looking at, at technologies that are less than a decade old and you're pushing hard, and, but they're amazingly uh, rapid progress being made. So we can't promise anything like next week or next month, but you know, we think it's, it's reasonable within you know, our time, you know, a, years or two to get this. And what the advantage of gene correction is, you're not taking drugs every day. <laughs> You'll be able to do a correction that will be permanent. And that is really powerful. Uh, and so, so, you know, you don't want to overpromise, but on the other hand, there is very rapid progress in this field, emerging field. And so. Yeah, so I'd, I'd make one other quick comment. And Charlie's absolutely right, but um, the NIH, is working very hard on a number of different um, gene editing systems. And what they've put together is something called the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Project, which is bringing together a consortium of a large number of laboratories that are working on gene editing systems. And they're developing new editing systems. And then the NIH is validating those in small animal models, either in mi typically in mice. And then they're gonna translate those to large animals as well and make sure they work there as well. So there, there's this real concerted effort among the community as well as the National Institutes of Health to rapidly advance these technologies so that we can translate them to a variety of different diseases. Um, and, and that's the great thing about this toolbox that's being made is that in principle, um, you know, it can be applied to a huge number of different disorders. So I would, I would just say to the patients that we're working very hard and that our hope is that within a short time span, we're going to be able to translate these, um, you know, new technologies into therapeutics for a variety of diseases, including 2G and 2I. Okay, great. Um, we have a, another question from Jane Lockwood. Did you see a difference of where you inserted the corrected gene in the middle or next to exon 4 and the efficacy? Yeah, we did. And so um, we, we saw it more efficient when we included it next to the exon. And this just has more to do with um, differences in the local sequence of the introns versus the um, near the exon. It turns out that um, our genome is littered with uh, a number of um, 
uh, endogenous retroviral elements that have uh, inserted into our genome over um, evolutionary timescales. And so there are a lot of sequences and introns that are actually common to other places in the genome. They're not unique. And so um, sometimes inserting into introns um, or targeting nucleases to introns is more challenging because those sequences share a lot of homology very or similarity to sequences elsewhere in the genome. And that makes it hard to do specific editing. And so we're getting more efficient results neighboring the exon just because um, the sequence there appears to be um, relatively unique. And that's allowing us to insert our correction cassette more efficiently there. Okay, thank you. That was a good answer. Um, we have another question. To clarify, would an eventual treatment apply only to existing muscle cells or would new cells also be fixed? Yes, we are very interested in trying to make this a durable therapy by uh, correcting stem cells that will allow for new muscle to be made with a corrected gene. That is a high priority for us. And again, a pioneering area, which, you know, but we have some really good ideas on how to do this. But you, that's a very good question because to get a durable therapy, you need to be able to replace the muscle with corrected, with cells, satellite cells that are corrected genetically. So that the repaired muscle has the corrected gene in it. Uh, so this is a very good question. And for the field, this is, this is where we need to go with, with gene correction uh, technology for muscle disease. Get into the stem cell pool so that you do get a permanent correction. You want to add, Scott, to that? No, that's good. It stems, uh, satellite cells are, the, are key, and, and Charlie and I are we're working on it, uh, but it's not as developed as the, the data we were showing. Could someone use their own stem cells, for example? Yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, and so iPS cells are a person's, iPS myoblasts are the stem cells as I showed you, are sort of equivalent to the adult stem cells. Uh, so yes, that would be the that would be the approach. Either you make the stem cells with IPS from a patient's adult cells, make them into uh, IPS stem muscle stem cells, or you take stem cells from the patient muscle and do those corrections. That um, often with people with muscular dystrophy, the stem cells are harder to get out of diseased muscle. So. But in any case, you're absolutely right. This is the power of the technologies we're talking about, either IPS or adult stem cell technologies. You want to be able to correct the patient's cells themselves. Um, so it's very important. So that's a good point. Okay. Um, we have um, an individual listening from Australia. His name is Gavin. Hi, Gavin. Um, he has a question. Would you expect a person with 2i to have completely normal physical function like they've never had the disease if they had this treatment? Well, one of the big challenges, and again, another great question, so um, is whether you can turn the train around after disease has happened and go back to normal. And that's something that's very important question to be able to answer. And it's not clear, um, but because stem cells are so efficient in for just repairing disease for, or just normal muscle, if you exercise, uh, it's very efficient. If you can get into the stem cell pool and do the correction there, the chances of getting repair are good. What has to be overcome, and again, it's, um, it's normal function is again a question. Uh, you know, function is good. My daughter's in a wheelchair. She uh, does not want to walk, but she wants to be able to use her hands better. <laughs> so, you know, what you can do, getting better is, is the goal. So some muscles may be too damaged but to repair them, but 
others may not. And so again, I, th I think that if you get, if we can repair the regenerative cells, you have a better chance to turn around disease progression. But if it goes too far, you know, it's going to be harder to do. So, but it, it's very important in, in terms of when for g clinical trials, when do you, what patient, do you do it early in stage disease or late stage disease? And so, and we'd like to be able to turn it around for sure. So, sort of a. That's very good. Um, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, another um, person living in internationally over in Europe. And she um, said, um, is this something that could help out alpha sarcoglycanopathies and will this only be something in the United States or are you also working with other countries? There, uh, the alpha district, all the glycanopathies, there's a whole large number of them with different mutations in different um, of the enzymes that make sugars. FKRP is one of the most prevalent of the glycanopathies, but there are others. And so in general, each gene and each type of mutation, we'd have to look at to design a strategy to do the correction. So, so we would need to look at, at the, you know, as we sort of illustrated with the FKRP mutations, we decided on this cassette strategy because we could then take be independent of any mutation in FKRP, we could correct all of them at once. So, but when you get the other enzymes, we'd have to look at those to see. But I want to make a general point here is that success with any one of these dystrophies will move us forward enormously for any other dystrophy because we're, the technologies we're developing, how do you deliver gene correction technology to muscle? Well, that could be applied once you get the correction worked out in IPS cells. That can, if we can deliver, then any progress we make towards delivery to satellite cells or to muscle can be applied to any of these other diseases. And so it's, there's a, a lot of synergy happening for people work, for, for investigations on one disease that'll have big implications for the whole muscular dystrophy community. And I think that's really powerful to keep in mind that, you know, some of these diseases are very rare. 2G is very rare, but it's a disease we probably can cure pretty quickly uh, with this kind of technology. So, but we'll learn a lot on the, on the, ride, on the ride doing it. So, so I think uh, it's a good question, but again, it's the human genome and each mutation, each gene that's mutated, there's a different strategy you can come up with uh, that some may be more efficient than others. And so it's, have to look at each uh, each disease and each mutation from that perspective. But again, as I emphasize, the toolbox is very growing, very deep to be able to figure out to come up with unique strategies. So, okay, great. And so we have a lot of gene therapy coming out um, all over, really the world. I think we've got Genathon in Europe. We have Sarepta in the United States. Um, we have several other companies doing uh, gene therapy with Duchenne. Um, a question would be, can this type of therapy be given after someone receives gene therapy, maybe from a from an AAV, could they also receive this? If it's AAV, you only have one shot. Mm -hmm. Again, that's why we need to work on delivery by things that aren't AAV. And there is really good reason to think that there will be ways to deliver that don't require AAV. But I, and a point that maybe I didn't make in the 2i project, gene correction project discussion was uh, our cassette therapy, we're able to correct the disease in the context of the normal gene. So we put a repair the exon for FKRP, but we don't disturb the expression of the gene itself. That is how much it's made, when it's made. And so this is an advantage we think of this kind of being able to correct the gene itself without introducing a, trans, a gene by gene therapy. 
where you can't really control the level of expression of the gene. Not that that shouldn't be tried and it could be successful, but one of the goals we have is to try to find strategies that'll correct the gene itself in the context of the genome and not introduce extra genes, even if they're wild type genes. So, so it's, it's a very good point. Uh, gene therapy in the classic sense is a, has been shown to have great promise. And so for some diseases, uh, but it, it, uh, you know, it, it probably will have some limitations and that gene correction that has to do with keeping the normal gene, but just fixing it uh, will probably have significant advantages. Okay. Um, I had a question about how would you perfuse all of the muscles with this? Um, how would you go about doing that to reach all the muscle cells? Well, AAV can do that, pretty much so, including heart. Um, and one of the things we're trying to develop is, you know, ways to deliver more efficiently AAV to muscle compared to other, other tissues. But so that works. But again, the kind of deliver it, it all comes down to delivery for clinical trials. So can we come up with a technique that will allow us to deliver to all muscles? or to muscles that you really think need to be functionally repaired to have better quality of life. Um, and, uh, and it's not, muscle is all over <laughs> and they all get affected. And so it's, it is a challenging part of gene, ther of gene correction, gene therapy for muscle is that there's lots of different muscles that are distributed throughout the body. They all have very specialized functions and can you deliver to the ones you need to deliver to, like the diaphragm, if you keep breathing? There are some critical muscles, and then there's some muscles that are that, that uh, maybe not so critical. But yeah, the AV right now can deliver to a lot of the muscles of the body. Scott, okay. do you want to add anything? Um, I mean, as Charlie mentioned, we're working on other methods for delivery as well. So um, I should say that the scientific community is uh, nanoparticles, other approaches, that would not be viral based. And um, so that you wouldn't be limited with regards to the number of times that you could treat a patient. So you could imagine if you have a non-viral system where you don't get an immune response to the components you're delivering um, because they're not expressed for very long, you can dose a patient or you can imagine injecting different muscle groups at different times, um, tuning the, uh, the amount of correction uh, to get it just right for a patient. So. Uh, you know, there are other strategies we're working on right now. You know, I, I would also just again emphasize this, that AAV has been really remarkable way to get us in, but I think we all, the field would, we would like to find these alternative ways to deliver because it does have this limitation and it's very hard to make enough AAV to be effective. But so, but that, so that's where the frontier is. Okay. Um, we're going to take two more questions. Um, we have one from Clara Marco. How can we know when a muscle is too damaged to improve if the cells can be regrown to an extent with stem cells and growth factors? Ideally, would it be a possibility to gain functional muscles again? I say never say never. <laughs> um, what, what happens in degeneration is that the muscles replaced by connective tissue. You know, a lot of um, tissue, which is, uh, you know, there to just back up muscle when it's not there so that everything doesn't fall apart and uh, tendon-like stuff. And so, so that's what's hard about it. If there's, uh, it, it's a, there's a lot of other tissues that now take over into the muscle. But never say never, we, we, I mean, we just don't know enough and, uh, and I, I, I would say, you know, we should be optimistic and there will be ways to maybe replace uh, damaged muscle with good muscle, you know, get rid of that damaged muscle, put in good muscle. I mean, you gotta just have to be optimistic that, that we can do it. It is seemingly, it is sort of traditionally thought to be a problem to have all this damage. But again, we don't know, how, until we get a therapy, we don't, that it's gonna work. We don't know how, big a problem that is. It may not be such a big problem. Okay. Okay, thanks. 
And then our last question, um, we actually had a couple of people ask this. Um, why is there two different approaches for 2i and 2g, and what is the difference between the two? Scott, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so as, as Charlie mentioned, for 2i, we were looking for a strategy of, of cassette repair that will allow us to uh, address patients that have a variety of different mutations. Um, in principle, you could apply the same strategy for 2G, um, but for the microduplication that we were talking about that you can collapse down um, to the wild type allele, you, if you don't have to um, deliver a correction cassette, uh, it simplifies the delivery problem with regards to getting the nuclease into the cells and, and getting the desired outcome. And so, again, it's just... Um, two different strategies, uh, adapting the, the strategy that looks best to the particular disease um, and gene. And, um, but in principle, um, for instance, as Charlie was saying, if the 2i strategy works with the repair cassette, you could apply this to um, many other um, uh, diseases, many other genes as well. So um, they're both valuable to look at. And I, I could just add on to that, Scott, with the microduplications with 2G, one of the things we discovered is that there are many genes that have microduplications, many, 423, or I forget the number, where that cause human pathology in the clinical database. So there's lots of ways. So the microduplication is just not 2G. It turned out that these microduplications cause other muscle diseases uh, and are mutations that cause other muscle diseases and neural diseases. So, um, so, Again, the application of particular strategies using the basic fundamentals of Cas9 and guide RNAs, uh, you know, depending on the mutation, you can get a, a real winner like the microduplication for 2G turns out to be uh, applicable to over 400 other diseases that are well known and documented. So, the genetic diseases. So. That's wonderful. You guys are so knowledgeable and this has been Wonderful. I want to say thank you for answering all of these questions. And they were very good questions from our audience. And thank you so much for being with us. And at this point, we're going to welcome Kelly Brazo um, to talk with us for a little while. Kelly, are you there? Hi. I'm just going to go. Should I go ahead and share my screen now? Yeah. yeah. Kelly's going to share her screen with us. And she's going to be talking through cure about cure lgmd2i and her foundation and as everybody knows i also have lgmd2i and so her efforts are so much very much appreciated by myself um and i want to say thank you to kelly and all that they do with um the 2i and for the 2i community and kelly if you will go ahead and just talk and share your slides so the community can know more about your efforts Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for this awesome webinar. I appreciate your updates and we're really, I, I think I speak for the entire community of, of the limb girdles in general that this is a really exciting cutting edge research and we're so happy to be able to have sponsored it because of our supporters. So just to tell you a little bit about our foundation, um, I have um, a daughter named Sammy. She is 12 years old now. She is diagnosed with LGMD2I or R9 as we're calling it sometimes now. Um, but just a little background. Um, Sammy was two when we really started noticing some changes specifically in her favorite activity, which was gymnastics, um, just falling a lot, all the, um, you know, a lot of challenges. We noticed other kids were just kind of running circles around her, um, essentially. So at that time, we went through lots of testing um, and found out that she did have 2i. And at that point, we decided to start a foundation in her name to uh, raise money for much needed research. Um, that was 10 years ago, hard to believe, but, um, and uh, so despite, you know, kind of growing and having a lot of support, we realized um, back in 2016 that it really wasn't just about Sammy. It's about everybody in the Limb Girdle 2i community that we wanted to sort of be more broadly recognized as, as the sort of the place that specifically um, takes donations for research and awareness programs for LGBT2i. 
Um, and we are really thankful. We've made so many partnerships along the way that we would not be able to do what we're able to do. Um, John Pierre at the LGBTQI Research Fund, we have done a ton of collaborative um, projects on funding with them. Obviously, we've teamed up with the Speak Foundation and Kat Brian here, who has, is doing so much great work for the LGMDs overall. Um, the LGMD2I or the LGMD of Awareness Day program. Um, they're doing an amazing job of spreading awareness throughout, you know, internationally of, of all of the limb girdles. Um, the Stevenson Family Fund, who um, has raises funds specifically for our foundation. And um, we've, you know, just some of the industry partners, specifically ML Biosolutions that we're working with actively as they're um, spearheading some uh, very exciting clinical trial. Um, just over the last 10 years, we've been able to fund over $630,000 in research and awareness programs. These are just some snapshots of the different hospitals um, and foundations that we, or programs that we've been able to fund. So we're very thankful to our, all of our donors who've been able to make this possible. Um, but really, this is just kind of beginning. It's the tip of the iceberg. Um, some of our most um, dear and true to our hearts programs, um, the Iowa District of Lycanopathy Family Conference, we're able to fund, uh, you know, help sponsor every year. Um, it's where we sort of found our connection to the 2I community and specifically Sammy, um, as you can, this is her in the middle here and her older sister Marina. It's really just such an important time for her each year to um, as she puts it, the people there just get me, mom, um, and to really make friends and, and a family, essentially, of a 2I community. And we're so thankful for the work that Iowa does to, to make this possible. It's a really awesome conference that was virtual this year, but hopefully we'll be in person again soon. Um, and of course, this we were able to help sponsor the amazing uh, the national conference last year in Chicago um, that was held by the Speak Foundation. And this was our to I team that we sort of met up with while we were there. And that was really exciting. Um, but I want to also really give a huge shout out and thank you to our team of it's um, the beautiful thing about our foundation is it is we have very little overhead. We are a fully volunteer or based organization. We don't pay any salaries. We all work out of our homes. So when, when money is donated to our foundation, it really goes to um, to research and awareness programs. I want to thank Dan, Dan Pope, um, who really helps me spearhead the fundraising. Um, Tony Hartman with marketing. Justin Fuhr helps us with our website. John Spencer with our graphic design. And Dr. Stevenson, who has a son named Carter, who was just recently at UMass. Um, he is our medical director. I also have um, three ambassadors I want to thank. Alana Hosman, who was our first ambassador. And um, this year we've added Karen Cole and Carter Stevenson as our ambassadors for the 2i team. Um, and I want to invite you all to our team <coughs> at the event. Sorry if that was a little loud, but um, every year we've been able to pride ourselves. We have one really big event we do every year. Um, it's a casino night. Normally we hold it locally in Pennsylvania where I live. And for obvious reasons, we're going virtual this year. And the silver lining of that is that we can invite everybody to attend um, from the comfort of their comfort of their homes. Um, so many people say, how do we get involved? What can we do? So this is a great way. We would uh, love for you to tune in and register through Zoom. Um, um, as it said in the little bit, video there. A lot of you in the 2i community are familiar with Melissa Grove. She is tons of fun and she's um, volunteering to MC for us for the night. Um, you'll see my family and also lots of patient stories. Um, we'll be introducing our ambassadors. We'll have musical entertainment, some games of chance. Um, we'll have an online auction and trivia games to win some uh, swag from our, our LGMD 2i gear, as we say. Um, certainly you can register. Uh, the easiest way is just to go to our website, um, curlgmd2i.com forward slash events. So go ahead and register. Um, it's free registration, but you can also donate to um, win some raff for raffle tickets for prizes. And there will be a virtual auction as well. Um, we're actively, certainly if you want to have anyone that would like to donate prizes or sponsor, you could do that on our website. And um, we will kick off the virtual auction on September 30th as sort of our way of celebrating the Global Inter um, Limb Girdle Awareness Day. 
So um, by all means, if you want to share that link with your friends and family, I know many of you have friends and family that want to get involved and say, how can we help? So this is a great way that anyone can certainly get involved if they're interested in. Um, and my fundraising committee, I want to thank Karen Cole, Melissa Grove, Kristen Olson, Dan Pope, Julie Savage, John Spencer, and Lacey Woods. And um, again, just want to say thank you so much. If you have any questions, certainly you can ask me now, or we can obviously um, reach out through email or our website. And um, I want to say thanks again to Catherine and Drs. Emerson, Dr. Emerson and Dr. Wolf. I'm really excited that we got to do this today. So thanks. Thank you so much, Kelly. And we're just so excited about what QRLG and D2I is doing for the community. And um, I wanted to also say to everyone, if you have questions that you would still like answered and for some reason you uh, didn't uh, submit them during our Q&A or before our Q&A, we want to give you an opportunity to still submit questions. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, Emerson and Dr. Wolf will be happy to field questions after the webinar. Um, so what I would like for you to do, if you have a question, just send them to Catherine at thespeakfoundation.com and we'll be available for questions for the next 24 hours. If you have them, just submit them and then I will field them over to our doctors and then they will send responses back and I'll send it to you. So for the next 24 hours, you know, if you have a question that wasn't answered, feel free to send it in. And then this webinar will be published to our platform on YouTube. Um, our YouTube channel has many educational webinars for LGMD, um, and you can go on and watch them. And we want to thank Sarepta Therapeutics, who's a sponsor, as a gold sponsor for most of our LGMD educational webinars they are the sponsor for. So we want to thank them. And thank you guys so much for being with us today. And thank you to Cure LGMD 2i for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you guys so much. And y'all have a good weekend.